You know, brethren, I think it's fair to say that all of us here in this room have a story to say, a testimony to tell, something that I'm sure that if indeed you were asked and given the proper forum to, to share with people, you would have your story on what compelled you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think it's also fair to say that since your relationship with Jesus Christ has commenced, and I premise this with this simple fact that if indeed you are engaged, because let's face it, there are Christians who claim Christ as their Savior, but do not do a thing about it. They still go about their way, you know, smoking and drinking and doing what they do and, uh, you know, uh, continuing to lie and cheat and be irresponsible and all the things and anything that really and frankly could not be defined as what Jesus would do. And you know, there are a lot of folks that claim Christ, but they'd be hard-pressed to provide evidence that they are indeed Christians. But that goes without saying. My point is, with that being said, that if indeed you are engaged and actually involved, and I say that uh, with all sincerity, and doing the best you can to convert, you are involved in the process of conversion. I think it's fair to say that I think we'd all agree to this, too. That we've all been struggling from time to time. Because Christianity is not a cakewalk by no means. It's a difficult way of life if you're really going to attempt to employ yourself and actually take up the burden, or as, as the Bible says, take up the cross, the stateros, and, and do uh, what is expected of you as a Christian. In addition, I think it's also fair to say that it is hard on occasion to know what God's will is in your life. And in addition to that, it's also hard, let me put this word to it as well, not only to know what God's will is, but to understand it and how you fit into it. To do it is difficult, to know it is difficult, and to understand it is difficult, often in our lives, because life is so dynamic. You've often heard me say it is so high-powered and moving and fast sometimes. And we get bombarded by different difficulties and conflicts and circumstances and challenges. And sometimes even our own weaknesses come involved with it because of our upbringing, our background, our gender, whatever we are, our race. Point being is life is difficult and oftentimes can camouflage the will of God and cause you to misread, cause you to misinterpret, cause you to misunderstand what the will of God is in your life. There are two broad categories regarding the operation of the will of God in one's life. I want to share with you over here a story in Genesis chapter 12 to illustrate one of these broad categories. In Genesis chapter 12 is the story of Abraham. Many of you may be familiar with it, maybe you're not, you should be though, and that is simply where God asked Abraham, look, I want you to get out of your own country, leave your family, and if you do, I'm going to make you a great nation, and also through your seed, all humanity will be blessed. The two major promises that your Bible truly is premised on. A great, physical, wealthy nation Abraham was promised to become, as well as he, his seed, his lineage, his ethnicity would be used to provide a savior to all of mankind. And rightly so, guess what? Abraham had a son Isaac, Isaac had a son Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, one was Judah, and through that tribe came the Messiah, Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't a Cherokee. He wasn't Polish. He was a Jew. <laughs> and so as a result, God fulfilled that promise, and we understand that. And in this particular case, Abraham here, in this chapter 12, is being told now, leave the family. If you do, you're going to get those promises, and we understand that's exactly what he did. However, here's what happens. He comes down over here in verse 10, and we find that there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. It came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said to Sarai, her name would be changed later on to Sarah, but right now it's Sarai, his wife, behold, now I know you're good looking. You are fair to look on. You are hot. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm telling you, we're going into Egypt, and, and you are going to attract a lot of attention, girl. <laughs> 
So here, here's what, I'm putting it in kind of common vernacular, but this is what Abraham is saying. This is what Abraham is saying. And he's saying, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell them you're my sister. I don't want anybody to know she's, you are my wife. Because they might kill me <laughs> to get you. <laughs> you know. So he says here, I pray you, verse 13, that you are my sister. That it may be well with me for your sake, and my soul shall live because of you. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman. Sure enough, wow, everybody was knocked out with this gal. She came into Egypt, and man, she was a knockout. And so they all noticed her. And he entreated Abraham, that is the Pharaoh, verse 15, the princes, all, princesses, uh, princes, I'm sorry, also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken immediately into Pharaoh's house. <laughs> There's a waste of time. The boys want to take a closer look at you. I mean, that's what it boiled down to. And so whoosh, there she went up to Pharaoh's house automatically, just like that. And lo and behold, here he goes in verse 16 now. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, because remember, Pharaoh thought this was his sister. <laughs> and so uh, they threw, throw this big party, sheep and oxen and, and men servants and so forth. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because Sarai, Abraham's wife, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you've done to me? So somehow through some process, he came to understand that Sarai was not his sister, was indeed and in fact his wife. And basically, he now is receiving curses by God and understands he's been set up with this deception on Abraham's part. Well, lo and behold, the point being here, in verse 19, we, we see uh, Pharaoh continuing the inquisition here. Why did you say she's your sister? So that I might have taken her to be my wife. Now, therefore, behold your wife. Take her. Get out of here. And he's lucky. I'll tell you what, he was blessed to get out of there with his life after that and doing that kind of a thing to the Pharaoh of Egypt. As a matter of fact, I still scratch my head wondering what went on that allowed him to get out of there with his head still attached, if you know what I'm saying. Because he, he really put the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was upset about it uh, in a very, uh, what you could say, hard uh, place, you know, uh, uh, a difficult situation. And so Pharaoh commended, in verse 20, his men concerning them. They sent him away, his wife, and all that he had. But here's the point on all of this. And a lesson for all of us to keep in mind. As I mentioned, there are two broad categories of knowing or how to interact with God's will. And one of them is even though Abram was operating within God's will, and I say this clearly because in the earlier portion of chapter 12, he's told to leave by God. It doesn't get more clearer than that. So you know he's operating within God's will. He left. And then circumstances dictated to him to take care and concern due to the famine, so he went into Egypt. But where he made his mistake, he veered off of God's will, didn't he? He lied. He deceived. He started conspiring with his wife and got her to agree Look, you tell him, the pharaohs or anybody who comes and t asks you who you are when we get into Egypt because you're so good looking, to protect me, I want you to say, you're my sister. So all this conspiring, all this conniving, all this ruse, all of this deception, Abraham went off the reservation. He started interfering with God's will and complicated, did he not? Did he not? Complicated the circumstances for himself. And we don't know, the Bible's not really that clear there in the latter part of chapter 12 on just how close he came to being killed. Right? And he is, we know pharaohs of Egypt were not known for their mercy, forgiveness, and uh, relief, as, they would, uh, as we would see here being given to uh, Abraham in this particular case. But the point is well taken, brethren, that here is a perfect example of someone who is indeed taking it upon himself to actually interfere in the will of God in their life, and this is the point I want to make, by taking the liberty to engage his own or her own judgment in the circumstances that they find themselves in. And as a result, make a bad situation or a risky situation worse because they took 
circumstances into their own hands and thwarted what perhaps God could have done or would have done if they would have just been a bit more, and we're going to get to that in a moment, and I'm going to leave that as a blank for you to just kind of think about on what I'm alluding to in this particular case. Second story, similar situation, but want to share it with you over here in regards to the birth of Esau and Jacob, the heel grabber. <laughs> over here in chapter 25, chapter 25, and this chapter essentially describes the birth of Esau, the twins, and Jacob. They, uh, here in verse, and we'll break into the context in, uh, let's say, verse 21 of Je uh, Genesis 25, 21 here. Isaac enters, that's uh, the, the father of uh, Esau and Jacob. Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. She couldn't have babies. And so he, he implored, he prayed, he you know, did what he could do to ask God to allow his wife, uh, in this case, uh, to have, uh, have these babies, and, or have a baby. And so, uh, lo and behold, the Lord was entreated of him. And, verse 21, Rebekah, his wife, did conceive. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it so be, why uh, am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, there are, this is interesting, you always don't want to just read over things, brethren. You have to understand something. You under, you, to understand even world events today, a little digression, but the fact of it is you want to know why a lot of the fightings and, and all of the riffraff and a lot of the disruption between the cultures of people today are what they are today. Well, right here, in the beginnings of beginnings, in the book of Genesis, a lot of those premises, a lot of those foundational animosities are laid down right here for your own perusal if you'll have the faith enough in order to believe it. Because as it's played out in these latter days, a lot of these nations that we see today are nothing more than the sons and daughters of generations that have been passed down from these very beginnings. And here, lo and behold, you're going to find out that in this particular case, in verse 23, we're told very clearly, these are two nations of people. Clearly. The statement is made, Esau and Jacob represent nations. They're not just two little human beings, two babies struggling in the womb of Rebekah. They represent two nations of people and would later on be the genesis or the fathers of those peoples. Now granted, Jacob was a, a carry-on of that promise given to Abraham through Isaac to him, that then he dispersed to his, to his son Joseph on one aspect and to his other son Judah on the other but the point of this that I want to make here is, and this is important to, uh, to take note and be clear about, and that is that these are two nations that are in her womb and two manner of people, two types of people. And, and it goes on here. It says, uh, they shall be separated from your bowels and one people shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. Meaning Esau, who we will find out is the firstborn with Jacob holding on to his heel, was indeed the firstborn. However, in the long run, the way this relationship plays out, the younger Jacob will actually be served by Esau. Esau will serve, be subservient to Jacob. And that's the way it does play out, even in today's modern day and age, with, as we understand, prophecy and the identities of nations, with um, Esau being intermingled with Arabs and Turks, and, of course, Jacob being the uh, progenitor of and the recipient of the birthright of promises of the United States and Great Britain. That's another story. Point being here in this particular case, verse 24, when her days were deliver, uh, be, uh, to be delivered and were fulfilled, behold, there were twins. And here we go. The first came out, was red all over, the hairy garment. Uh, he was kind of a man's kind of a man. Esau was his name. And after this, he, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. He was the heel grabber. Uh, Jacob was the heel grabber or the supplanter. And he had Esau's heel as he was coming out right after him. They came out like a train, you know, one right after the other. Kerplunk, kerplunk. <laughs> and uh, here it was, the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. Jacob, he was more of a plain man, dwelled, dwelled in tents. He was a little softer and a little bit more, uh, what you could say, less uh, uh, outdoorsman type. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat his venison. Isaac was more like his father, Jacob, or uh, uh, Isaac. I'm sorry, Jacob, uh, Esau was more like his father Isaac. And in this particular case, Isaac favored Esau, as we are told here in verse 28. But Rebekah, she loved Jacob. Verse 29, Jacob 
uh, sod pottage, and Esau came from a field, and he was faint. This kind of, we're fast forwarding here. There's a lot of time that has passed through these short amounts of scriptures, because now the boys are already grown up. And here we see that Jacob sod pottage, and Esau came from the field. Uh, must have been hunting or running around out there, but at any rate, he was faint, faint enough to where Jacob basically swindled him out of his birthright. Uh, you know, that, that plays a lot on other sermon topics of what will it take for you to sell your birthright. You know, that would be a good sermon in itself on uh, what it took here to Esau. It just took him a bowl of soup to sell his birthright. What would it take for you to sell your birthright that you have rightly given to you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Again, that's another subject for another time. But at any rate, we find here as it plays out that Jacob does indeed get the birthright. He, in verse 31, Jacob outrightly says to him, look, I'm going to give you the soup if you want it, but before I do, you've got to give me your birthright. That's the deal. And so Esau says, well, look, I'm so, I'm so hungry and faint, I'm going to die, and so therefore give me the soup. You've got my birthright. I'll give it to you. And so he does. He goes ahead and gives him the birthright. And as we understand, the uh, rest in that respect is history. However, as time went on and Isaac gets close to his death, here, in this particular case, we find the ruse that took place in chapter 27, Genesis chapter 27. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but again, I'm just going to reference the event that occurred here in regards to how Rebekah conspired with Jacob to fool Isaac, who was at this time now on his deathbed with very bad sight and was easy to fooled him, obviously, because he was almost blind, apparently. And Rebecca went ahead and made some things to make Jacob's arms real hairy. She herself cooked the venison like, he, uh, like she knew he liked it and gave it to Jacob to give to his father. The story goes that the father was indeed fooled, Isaac, and he went ahead, Isaac, thinking that he was blessing Esau, blessed Jacob, and that's how it played out. And the blessing of the birthright went to Jacob, supplanted it. He essentially got it by the swindling effort of his mother, who he conspired with him, Jacob, to get it from Esau. And of course, we understand how the blessings played out and how Esau was so brokenhearted and how he himself was indeed so disappointed and so filled with hate and anger over Jacob that literally this almost got Jacob killed. Remember how the story plays out? And Rebecca tells him, no, you go to your uncle Laban and you go over there and live and get away from Esau because he's out gunning for you and he's going to take your life. So for your own self-preservation uh, and your own safety, you get out of the land here and you go to your, your, your uncle and uh, spend your, the rest of your life over there. Find yourself a good wife, a good woman, and settle down over there and get away from Esau because Esau was out to kill him. Point being again, here you have the will of God, the birthright was indeed given up, it was give, uh, going to be given up from the day one anyhow because you know of the way the names of the boys were and all and how God would have worked that out. We don't know, do we? We do know this, that Esau did give his birthright up. So really, with that being said, there was no need for Rebecca to take into her own hands, again, what she felt was necessary in order to assure Jacob, to get that birthright blessing that he was deserving of in light of the fact that Esau sold his birthright. Point being here again, brethren, that in this particular case, when we uh, you know, lose control of doing God's will in our lives, and this is a, a major point I want to make here, when we lose control in doing God's will in our life, in doing God's will in our life, let alone not knowing, may not still understand it, but boy, we should. Should we not learn to know what God's will is so that we do it? We know what He would expect of us? Even though we may not understand where He's taking us in these circumstances, it is important we understand what to do in regards to His will, what His will is, and the way you identify that, of course is getting familiar with your Bible, getting familiar with his values and his standards and what he would expect you to do. So doing is one thing. I mean, you, know, you may not understand where you're going. You may not know exactly where he's leading you, but at least understand what to do. 
know God's will. That's important. And here's my, my cautionary statement. When you move off doing the will of God in your life, you begin to run the risk, an extreme risk, of complicating the circumstances you're involved with. So stay above the reproach. Take the, take the will of God's way every time. And if you're not sure what Jesus would do in this case, whatever that case may be that you find yourself surrounded by in those circumstances you're contending with and conflicted with, then maybe do a Bible study, maybe some fasting, maybe a little bit of prayer to ask God. You may not understand what this all means. You may not know where the ultimate end of this tra uh, travel or this journey is going to take you, but at least understand what you should know what to do in those circumstances in those circumstances. Because every time, and you read the Bible, and you see the circumstances of individuals who took the liberty to engage their own will in the conditions they found themselves in, to basically interfere and interrupt the will of God in their lives, you find in most cases the way it played out, whether it's the life of Samson, uh, whether it was uh, others throughout the Bible, they complicated their lives. And they caused additional grief. And in some cases, through extension, death and destruction in some cases. So it is important. It is very, very important that we discipline ourselves to improve the assurance, to improve the assurance of allowing the circumstances we find ourselves in to play out the way God wants them to. That's really really important. Now, don't get me wrong. That's only one broad category of how we interact with God's will. Okay? We interact with God's will on occasion. Let me just redefine that category so we've got it clear in our minds. We interact with God's will occasionally by interfering with it in our lives. By choosing to take the liberty to go off the reservation, for lack of a better term, if you know what I mean, and drift from the will of God and do something that is totally contrary, that we know is contrary, and maybe if we don't know it's contrary, then shame on us for not knowing, but because we do that, we complicate the circumstances, or as they would say, make a bad situation worse. That's one category. This is another category, because don't get me wrong. <laughs> The irony of this whole thing, that is the Christian walk, the irony of the Christian walk, is that you can do God's will and still get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and still have a lot of difficulty. You could walk the line letter of the law and do it just right, and guess what? You still get punched out. You still get figuratively, metaphorically bloodied. And, and in essence taken advantage of, or even perhaps, as they would say, lose a battle, whatever that battle may be. Uh, hopefully you won't lose the war, but you'll lose the battle here and there in the, pro uh, the progress of or in the procession of whatever the event is that you're finding yourself uh, involved with. And we have biblical precedent to understand and expect this over here in Hebrews. Let me remind you about this before we even proceed with some... Uh, additional scriptures here to share with you to illustrate what I'm talking about. But look over here to Hebrews chapter 2 because this is the biblical precedent that assures us, unfortunately, <laughs> that we're going to find our maturity, we're going to find our growth, we're going to find our perfection, not that we can achieve perfection in the flesh, but what I'm saying is progress. We're going to find it where it comes from, as your Bible states, is through the house of suffering. Jesus was no different. Look at this. Over here in Hebrews chapter 2, we see in verse 9 stated this very clearly. Uh, as we go down through this scenario of describing where we are right now in the way the plan of God has unfolded and what the status of the plan of God that has unfolded up to this point is, the writer states this. Uh, we see man, with potentially, that's what he's saying, to become really the co-heirs with Christ of the whole universe. However, not yet, the writer comes down and concludes, however, not yet. 
He says this, instead, this is what we see, but we see Jesus, verse 9, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That comes first, because that is the process by which God is redeeming humankind back, redeeming humankind back to him through the death of Christ. That has to come first before we can even become or think of becoming co-heirs with Christ, right? So that has to come first. That's what he's saying here, this writer, in that he's qualifying the fact that, look, this is what we see first. We see Jesus who's going to taste death for every man. Verse 10, though, this is important, and this is what I want to illustrate to you. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation, and here it is, mature or perfect or completed through health and wealth, you know, sow your seed with me and you'll get a brand new Cadillac. It doesn't work that way. Jesus learned his perfection. He learned the real life and the ins and outs of life through the things he suffered. Solomon wrote way back in the book of Lamentations, did he not? That in the house of suffering there is great wisdom. In the house of suffering. Unfortunately, if all we've got are good times and a, a walk in the rose garden, sadly we don't notice the things that we should because we're distracted by all the good things. The money or whatever it may be, the, you know, the, the riches and the, the, the wealth and, or, or the affluence or the materialism that we surround ourselves with. And so it's not necessarily, in that regard, uh, really a growing opportunity for us if things are always going good for us. And the Bible is clear, whether it's the book of Lamentations, whether it's the book and the writer of Hebrews, or over here, let me take you one more time just to lay this premise down on this message or theme in the Bible that tells us we as Christians learn through suffering in 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter for a moment here, chapter 4, and we read this. And Peter's admonition to all of us as Christians is, hey, Buckle in. Get ready. Life is not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, if you take up this way of life, the way of Jesus Christ, and live his standards and his values, especially in this society today, as we can see it going the way it's going, in this particular case, verse 1, very clearly stated by the Apostle Peter, he says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise. That's what he's telling the Christians. In other words, you arm yourself. You prepare yourself just like Christ did. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That's the same mindset. What is that mindset? Well, just think about it. I mean, Jesus had to be a pretty determined character, didn't he? A pretty disciplined character. He had to be really, I mean immensely, enormously, committed and dedicated goes without saying to the cause and the mission that he was here for. Just think about that. Because if he would have failed, we'd all be dead people. We'd be doomed. Thank God he did not fail and he could have. There was no predestination here involved guaranteeing that he was going to make it through this physical experience of this living this three-dimensional life in the flesh that he was incarnated to uh, guaranteed. There was no guarantee. He was at risk. Otherwise, we don't have a Savior that could be touched by the same infirmities, right? So in this particular case, he says, look, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered... Oh, look at this barometer. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Let me say it this way. He who has not suffered in the flesh, has not ceased from sin. Isn't that what it says? That's what it says in reverse. And that's why people say, well, God doesn't want us to have fun. Well, God wants you to have fun. But he wants you to have the kind of fun that's also fun tomorrow. That's the kind of fun that doesn't, doesn't hurt other people in the wake of your behavior. God wants you to have fun. God wants you to enjoy life within his framework within his definition because he knows 
by virtue of the fact he created us, what works best for us. Now it comes to play that we have to trust him on that, of course, but that's where we're heading, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here a little bit on that, uh, because I want to take you there slowly, step by step. So with this fact being told to us that we learn things through suffering, we understand that even though, and remember the second category here that we're, we're butting up on now, even though we may do God's will, and oftentimes people, and I've talked to people like that, even myself, I, I, I'd have to admit, I'd be a liar if I didn't admit this, that you know, there's some things that I just didn't deserve. There's some things that, has ha that have happened to me in my life, I'm sure you could say the same thing, that I just flat out did not deserve because I didn't do anything wrong. I did not do anything wrong. I don't deserve this. So God, that's what we always revert to, don't we? Why did you allow it? You know. But the fact of it is, the second category, brethren, we cannot dismiss this. We cannot dismiss this. The fact of it is, God is on a mission with you. I'm going to explain to you why it's also important that even if you are doing God's will, you will suffer. That's what your Bible says. And there's stories in the Bible that illustrate this. Notice, go back here with me to the book of Genesis again. And in this case, chapter 39. Genesis 39, you know this guy. He's Joseph, the son of Jacob. As a matter of fact, this was one of Jacob's, it was Jacob's favorite son. The boys were so jealous, the other 11, they sold this one into slavery. The Ishmaelites put him in a caravan, you know the story. And uh, if it weren't for Judah wanting to make money off of Joseph, uh, Joseph would have been killed. But Judah like a good Jewish individual looking to make a few bucks, went ahead and uh, took uh, Joseph and sold him off to the Ishmaelites. Well, the Ishmaelites bring him over to Egypt. And here we pick up the story. Joseph, now being sold into slavery, is brought down into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. This is chapter 39, book of Genesis, and verse 1. And he's the guard of the Egyptians, and it bought him at the hands of the Ishmaelites, who, of course, bought, uh, found uh, Joseph there out there in the, in the wilderness. Uh, and they had brought him there. Okay, verse 2 now, Gen Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, Egyptian. For the sake of time, I'm just going to paraphrase. You will read uh, here the story and find that Joseph wins over the trust of Potiphar. As a matter of fact, he wins such trust with Potiphar, and Potiphar trusts him so much and so well, he gives him full reign and rule over his household goods and allows Joseph in the house doing the business of the work of the house and managing the household alongside of a very lustful wife. And she has her eyes on Joseph. And so now she wants to basically get it on with Joseph. Joseph being the guy that he is because he's a very well-disciplined, very strong, dedicated guy and very trustworthy, honest, and he is very... Uh, what you could say dependable in this regard is not in any way, shape, or form even thinking of doing that and tells her so. She gets mad. Oh, she ain't taking that because she wants this guy pretty bad. And so finally it comes down to the fact that Pontifer is out on a trip wherever. They're there in the house alone. You know the story. She goes to grab him. He takes off. He pulls his jacket. She is left holding the jacket and he flees. Well, she's got the jacket. Now she's so mad and upset. So she frames him and claims that he tried to make a move on her. Potiphar comes back, throws Joseph in jail. And there's Joseph in jail. I didn't do anything! The woman's lying! She framed me! What do you mean? God, I'm doing your will! I did everything I could. I even eschewed this woman's uh, attempt on me to have uh, her way with me. I was the one. I was the strong guy. I was the one that slapped her down. I, and I'm in jail? How did this happen? So there he is in jail. And here comes uh, the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh gets mad at his baker, you know the story, and his butler. <laughs> and so the butler and the baker get thrown in jail along with Joseph. <laughs> and the butler and the baker have these dreams. And so the butler explains to Joseph that he had a dream. And he goes through this whole thing, and you can read about that uh, particular dream over here in chapter 40. I'm kind of just paraphrasing this for the sake of time, because I don't really have enough 
uh, time to go into the detail of it, but take time to read these, chapters 39 through 40 and 41. Point being, in this particular case, the butler goes ahead, explains his dream to Joseph. Joseph says, look, I can interpret the dream for you. Butler says, you can? Says, yeah. So he interprets the dream, and sure enough, as he, he finds out later, because not only did the butler have a dream, but the baker had a dream. Unfortunately for the baker, though, <laughs> the dream wasn't so good, because what essentially it was was that the butler in three days was going to be re-ingratiated to Pharaoh. Unfortunately, when the baker asked Joseph what was the interpretation of his dream, he said, well, in three days they're going to hang you from a tree and kill you. <laughs> and, and needless to say, it played out that way. Now, however, before that all played out and before that all ended, Joseph told the butler, look, I'm going to interpret the dream, but remember me. Remember, I'm interpreting the dream. Tell Pharaoh I did this. I want to get out of this jail. Tell him I'm okay. Tell him I'm a good guy. Tell, tell him that I interpreted the dream, that I know, okay? Do, go go to be my advocate. Help me out here. Well, as it played out, the butler, he lived. The baker, he died. <laughs> and guess what the butler did? Chapter 41, verse 1. It came to pass, at the end of two full years, what? But God, I did everything. I did everything I could. I have interpreted the dreams for these guys. Do you see Joseph taking action, involving himself, appealing grabbing whatever he could, whatever resources he could, to interfere with whatever the will of God is. You read the whole story? No, brethren. And guess what? What we see is how God works it out in this particular case. And lo and behold, God worked it out for Joseph. The rest is history. Joseph later on became second to Pharaoh. Not only that, but saving, literally, millions of people's lives over a, a famine, a period of famine throughout uh, the area in that particular case. Now, Joseph waited, and he waited, and here's a key word I wanted to, uh, basically I left blank before, but I wanted to illustrate to all of you now and lay this out to you. He waited patiently. He held back. He allowed God to take some action. He allowed God time. See, so often we ourselves don't allow God time. We immediately, we get impatient. Our human nature takes over. We want to get this thing done. We want to grab control. We want to be able to steer. We want to essentially push the buttons and, and turn the wheel so that we know because we feel better, don't we? We feel better when we're in control of the circumstances. I mean, it's just nature. It's human nature. Well, I, I'd have to admit one of the reasons why I went into the business for myself was because I couldn't work for anybody. <laughs> I mean, I just, it, it, that's oftentimes one of the driving reasons why people go to work and in business for themselves, because they get tired of all of the cuckoo in big corporations, you know, and so they go on and work for themselves. Point being, that's human nature, and we all have it to uh, greater and lesser degrees. Now, notice this. Um, over here in 1 Samuel, let me fast forward us over here to 1 Samuel and take us over to the transition period of King Saul going, losing his um, kingship to David. And we pick the story up over here in chapter 18 of this particular case where uh, Saul and uh, David essentially are illustrated as actually, and I bring you here only to illustrate this, that they started out as friends. They started out as comrades. They started out as kind of bosom buddies in the sense that uh, they, he, that is Saul, trusted David with certain authority and with certain tasks. Later on, though, as time went on, and as you read, um, Saul eyed David uh, uh, from that day forward, as verse 9 points out, because he became jealous of David, as David would wisely, in verse 5, pointing this out, behave himself with Saul, doing everything Saul asked him to do, unfortunately, uh, got him accolades, recognition from the people of Israel, which 
caused Saul to be jealous. Verse 7 illustrates a little bit of that, where the women said one to another, and they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands, you see. Saul didn't like that. He's supposed to be top dog. He's the one that's supposed to be the, you know, the great warrior, the one who's superior in, in all of this. And lo and behold, he saw people beginning to um, uh, look to David as one being superior over him. And so in verse 9, as Saul began to notice that, we see that he, verse 9, Saul eyed David from that day forward. Uh, and as you read the story and go through it, you begin to see how this all develops and begins to play, uh, play out. Um, ultimately, Saul even asks in uh, this particular chapter, verse 20, Michael, Saul's daughter, who loved David, uh, Saul then knowing this and finding out after he couldn't get David to marry his first daughter, told his servants in verse 22, look, you tell David he can have my daughter. Well, David mentions to the servants, look, in verse 23, uh, David said, seems it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I'm a poor man and am lightly esteemed. In other words, back in these days, you had a bride's price. If I wanted to marry somebody, I had to have money. And so I would pay the father money so I could have the, the woman for my wife, as the father would have to give me her dowry. And so that was the way it was. Uh, that goes into uh, the uh, marriage laws of Israel and all that. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of it. But the point of it is, David is saying, look, I'm a poor man. must not take a whole lot to get a king's daughter. Because I don't have anything to give the king. And Saul wanted David to marry Michael so bad, Michael so bad, that he said, well, look, you don't need to have anything. I'll tell you what. Here's what you've got to do. I want you to go kill a hundred Philistines and bring me their foreskins. Now, Saul had a motive. The motive was he never in his wildest dreams would think David is going to pull that off. No pun intended. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> there is no way, no way. But lo and behold, he not only slewed 100 Philistines, he took 200 out and brought back 200 foreskins. And Saul just, he couldn't believe it. He just could not believe it. Everything he did to this guy as he tried to kill him time after time, even with a javelin, throwing a javelin at him, and it hitting the wall, David Duncan. A couple times that happened. As you read through the story, it's a great story. You, you need to read this portion of your Bible. It, it's good stuff. It really is when you get down to some of the details in respect to verses 19 through, uh, the chapters, that is, chapters 19 through about 23. But let me advance you over here to chapter 24. Where uh, here, in this particular case, uh, we find that uh, David is on the run now. And in chapter 24, and in verse... Uh, is this where I want to be? Let's see here. Chapter 24. Yeah, chapter 24 and verse 1. And it came to pass... When Saul returned from following the Philistines, let me put it in context real quickly here. What was happening is Saul was chasing David down. And you can read that in chapter 23. And he was getting really close to David. As a matter of fact, they were so close that David was on one side of the mountain and Saul was on the other side of the mountain. They were going in parallel. They didn't know that they were that close to each other. And you can read about that in chapter 23. But then, lo and behold, Saul got word that the Philistines were attacking Israel. So Saul had to divert and David continued on in, in the caves and hid. Because he was on the run, Saul was looking for him to kill him. So now David is in a cave. All of his guys are back against the wall. They're in the dark. They're in a cave. And they're in this area. And lo and behold, who walks in the cave to go to the bathroom? Saul. Saul walks in the cave to go to the bathroom. So here he comes. David and these guys are in the shadows. They're all in the shadows. They watch the king come in. He does his business. Or is doing his business. And the guys are saying, David, the God of Israel has given you Saul. Take him. Take him now. David said, no. Quiet. No. Quiet. Shh. You know, I mean, these guys were fighters. These guys were the elite. These were the ops of the military. I mean, David had some gruesome guys. I mean, tough dudes. You wouldn't want to meet these guys. These guys were really 
fighters and warriors. And so lo and behold, what David did was he did appease him a little bit. David crawled up. How, I mean, think about it. He crawled up while Saul's doing his business, cuts a piece of his oh, his clothes off, grabs it, pulls back. And then he told those guys, stand down. And then, while David's holding this, you can read this in the story, I'm kind of paraphrasing for time, he starts feeling bad. He's feeling guilty. He did that to the king of Israel. The king of Israel. But notice this. Here's what I want to point out. He says here, The men of David said in verse 4 unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord has set unto you, behold, he will deliver your enemy into your hand. You may do to him as it seems good unto him. David arose, cut off the skirt of Saul's robe, because David got motivated to do that. But then it came to pass afterward, David's heart smote him, because he cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him. David respected the position so much, that even though Saul was such a character, such a scoundrel, and deserved, perhaps, in many respects, because it certainly was unjustified of the aggression he took on David's life, that if David did take him out, certainly it could have been, the case could have been made, it was a deserving act of execution that David did, because it's either him or me, so to speak. I mean, that's human nature. But David took, took the, the, the will of God role, and respected God's interaction in the situation so much that he reprimanded himself, telling himself, how dare I ever encroach on something like this, that I would actually show disrespect to the very anointed king that God put in position. Think about that. That's, that's a lot of character to think about that when this guy is out to kill you, and it's either him or you, and you do that kind of a thing and take that kind of a uh, approach. So David stayed his servants. He told them, stand down with these words and permitted them not to rise up against Saul. Saul rose up, got finished, walked out of the cave. Verse 8, David arose afterward. This is chapter 24, 1 Samuel, verse 8. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, cried to Saul, saying, my Lord, King! And when Saul looked back, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed, paying him, and well, he wasn't being sarcastic, he was just, you know, he was the king. The king turned around, David did the proper protocol. He respected him in that regard. David said to Saul, Wherefore, hear your men's words, saying, Behold, David seeks your hurt. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how that the Lord delivered you to the, today into my hand in the cave. And bade me, and my, and some bade me to kill you, but my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of your robe, I could, and killed you not, know you, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. You, I have hunted my soul to take it. The Lord's judge between me and you, and the Lord avenge me of you. But mine hand shall not be upon you. And he said the proverb of the ancients, Wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon you. After whom the king of Israel came out, after whom does you pursue, after a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and you, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of your hand. And it came to pass, when David was done speaking, unto Saul, Saul said, is, that, uh, is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. That's God's will in action. All David did was stand up for truth, stand up for honor, stood up for the right cause, stood up for honesty, stood up for the truthfulness of the situation. And guess what? It hit Saul right in the heart. Brought him to tears. Notice, he goes, on, he goes on here, and he says to David, You are more righteous than I! You are more righteous than I! For you have rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded you evil. And you have showed this day how that you have dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord has delivered me into your hands, you did not kill me in this regard. David 
would not, and here's the point, brethren, a major lesson I think all of us need to know as Christians. David refused very clearly, very definitively, very disciplined in this fashion, not lower himself to the level of those that were pursuing him. In no way, shape, or form would he grovel on that level and diminish the values that he had, that he stood, the boundaries that he knew and defined as, as uh, for him by the living God. He didn't compromise. He was very uncompromising. So, what am I saying in this? There are, as I say, two broad categories of working within the will of God. You can interfere with it in your life if you recognize it, or because you don't recognize it and get impatient, think you've got to take action and misread it, and misinterpret it, and make a bad situation worse, complicate your circumstances, run the risk of complicating the circumstances. By the same token, you can be a letter of the law person, do the will of God, and still get slapped down for it. So what is this that you're talking about, Bill? What is it? I mean, how, what's your point in all of this? Here's the point, brother. You have to understand something. All of us do. And that's why it's so critical and important and incumbent on all of us to truly comprehend this one point. Understand and capture this. You and I are all in a program. You know what it's called? Faith building program. FBP. It's a faith building program. If acronyms help you to remember, remember that. FBP. BP, British Petroleum. <laughs> but it is for faith building. It is for faith building. Everything you go through, if indeed you are an engaged Christian, is all about faith building. Why is that so important? Because God is concerned about one thing and one thing only. His relationship with you and your relationship with Him. And in this particular case, the way we please God now, and let me take you over here to Hebrews chapter 11 to substantiate some of this that I'm about right uh, to uh, introduce to you here. Because it's so very, very important in Hebrews chapter 11 that we get this point. And the circumstances that we find ourselves being faced with and contending with are indeed oftentimes the tools by which we, in the heat of our life, are essentially forged into the beings, the people that God wants us to be. And therefore, it's important then, obviously, when we go through these circumstances, that we have faith, that we have faith. God says here in chapter 11, verse 1, here's what faith is. It's the substance or the confidence of things hoped for, and it is the evidence or the certainty of things not seen. So faith is the confidence of things hoped for. I'm confident that what I'm hoping for is indeed going to come true. And uh, the certainty of things not seen. I am certain that I am bound for a resurrection and that God's kingdom is real. Jesus Christ is alive at the right hand of the Father and is going to come back to this planet and resurrect those that he knows are his. Those things are certain in my mind, between my ears, and the things that I believe is the evidence of that. My belief is that evidence. And hopefully that, as we developed it, verse 6, stay, is... is uh, benefited in this way to us by allowing us to understand, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And of course the inverse of that is, is that with faith you do. It is possible to live or to, to uh, uh, please God. With faith it is possible to please God. You go through this whole chapter 11, brethren, and read the stories of what these individuals, whether it was Enoch and Noah and Abraham, we, we read a few, Sarah, Jacob, Joseph, we read a few of these, Moses, we have Rahab the harlot, so many others, Isaac and so on. They were tracked down like dogs. They were hunted in caves and so forth. There's no health and wealth in these ministries and many of the lives of these people. For sure, they were beaten down and looked upon as the dregs and scourges of, of uh, life in so many respects. But guess what they did? Throughout their life's circumstances, regardless of how hot it got uh, around them, they themselves went ahead and pursued 
believing and knowing as pilgrims from another country, forging ahead through this life circumstances to maintain the course so that they would be assured of the promises of which, verse 13, notice this, of which these all died in faith, not having received, they're not in heaven, they didn't receive the promises yet. They're not in hell, they didn't receive any curses. They're not in purgatory. They have not received the promises yet. We're told that again in verse 39. And these all having obtained a good report through faith received. Not the, Moses is not in heaven. Enoch is not in heaven. Rahab is not in heaven. None of these people are in heaven. They have not received the promises yet. They knew they were pilgrims moving through life and time and in life circumstances to build faith toward what? A coming kingdom of God that is going to be reinstituted at the return of Jesus Christ and those that are dead in Christ will be raised uh, uh, first and those that are alive be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump and land where? On the Mount of Olives. When did the dead come back alive? At the last trump. That's what your Bible says. How many trumpets are there? We're told, Revelation, seven. There's seven trumpets. At the seventh trump, that's how I can say that, the dead will rise first in Christ, those that are alive, if they're alive and Christ returns in a twinkling of an eye, they shall be changed, meet Christ in the air, land on the Mount of Olives, read there in Zechariah 14, that's a prophecy. And from there, God's law will go out and cover the world like the ocean covers the seabeds, and ultimately, all of mankind will learn what world peace is really all about. But in the meantime, brother, that's the ultimate objective. In the meantime, going through life, oftentimes, is quite disorienting because the will of God is not always as clear as we would like it to be as to where we're going. But what I'm suggesting, what I'm suggesting is that you don't need to know exactly where you're going at the time you're going through what you're going through. In due time, that will manifest itself. Give God that. Trust God for that. What you need to focus on is doing the will of God during that time. Notice, real quickly here, because time's running out on me, in 1 Peter chapter 4, go back to there real quick, 1 Peter chapter 4, but in this time, go to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why am I going through this? I don't understand this. What is God doing? Not important. Trust God. Have faith. Know that He's got your best interests at heart. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it might be, keep the faith and learn to know what God's will is during the circumstances so that you don't interfere and you know when to engage and when not to engage, when to let Him work things out and when you should take a step. Those are the important aspects. Those are important in the present while you're going through those things. And Peter says, therefore, look, don't think it's strange that you're going through these things, but rejoice in as much as you are a partaker of Christ's sufferings, verse 13, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. In other words, if you do suffer wrong for being right, happy you should be. Happy. No problem, man. Irie, this is good. It's great to be persecuted. Wonderful to be beat up, to be betrayed, to be abandoned, to be hurt. It's a wonderful thing. Not so good when you're going through it. But the ultimate objective here is, Peter's telling you, do this, look it. For the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you, and on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So maybe they do speak evil of you because of your weird ways, you know. You don't do this and don't do that. But point being, you're glorifying God through it. And he cautions, don't let any of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, busybody, or other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, that's key, if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Because guess what? That might be God's will. That might be what the will of God is for you at that time in those circumstances to stand strong above the fray so that the example you're setting may be setting seeds for others who are observing or maybe even the very individuals that you yourself are contending with. You don't know. And frankly, in some cases, 
we're probably better off not knowing, otherwise we might get in the way. Military works like that, you know. On a need-to-no basis. <laughs> Take the hill. Why? Not important. Take the hill. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's really, in, in some respects, God works on that basis to a certain extent. And oftentimes, you can relegate it to this. He's protecting us from ourselves. So understand, Luke chapter 12, let me leave you with these words here. And I think hopefully many of us will be better for it. And these are the words of Jesus Christ himself, where he says here, brethren, in Luke chapter 21, I'm sorry, not 12, verse, chapter 21, verse 19. Jesus, talking about the latter days, he says this, and I'm just going to break into context here and try to extrapolate what this scripture says onto the context of what I've been talking about. In your patience, possess you your souls. In this context, brethren, possess your souls in patience as you work through your life's circumstances. Don't get in God's way. Study, fast, pray to understand what God's will is to do. And in time, in time you will understand and know the will of God. It may be years later. It might be at the end of your life why you went through something when you did. But what's most important is that you build the faith, you build the faith, Stay the course and let God's will work vibrantly in and through you. Blessed be those, brethren, blessed be those who wait on the Lord. Let me give you a homework assignment as I close up here. Read Psalms 27 and pay particular attention to the last verse of that chapter. Psalms 27, keep it close to your hearts and wait on the Lord because you will without a doubt, be blessed.